Hey everyone, this is Brave Space. A three episode podcast series starring a collective of women and allies discussing our experiences and spreading knowledge. In this episode, we'll be discussing all things dating and providing three outside perspectives. This will be breaking down the topic into four subgroups. Cultural standards. The concept of wifey material. Double standards between men and women. And birth control. Hi, my name is Rachel. Hi, my name is Amanda. Hi, it's Maria Flores. Hi, my name is April. And we're going to be discussing cultural standards within dating and wifey material. We will also be featuring Betty Hang, our guest speaker, to give us her take on cultural expectations and wifey material. My name is Betty. I'm currently a production assistant at Blind Light, which is a video game voiceover company in West Hollywood. I'm a recent graduate of UC Santa Barbara with majors in communication and sociology, and I identify as bisexual. Are there cultural standards placed on you in your dating life from your family, close circle, and society overall? So in the past, um, I've had um, Asian partners and my family is always more approving of them. And for me, it feels more comfortable to um, introduce them to my family because I know that my family would have a positive reaction. Um, If not positive, then something more neutral and and content uh, versus some uh, community that they feel against. Uh, So for example, Latino communities, my family is very racist against them and would automatically bring up these stereotypical comments, um, which I am very, very against. uh, But I also feel like it's important to use those moments as educational opportunities to, uh, you know, let them know that this is not all true, what what you've heard about these communities and that there's more to them and that they're just like us. There's bad Vietnamese people, there's great Vietnamese people, there's, you know, it's, it's a mix. So using those opportunities as educational opportunities for those who may have more narrowed views of these communities is an opportunity for me to make the most out of it. I think it's important, important to address the anti-Black and anti-Brown in specific communities because although we are POC, it doesn't mean that we're excluded from being racist. And I feel like I take this experience personal because I do come from a family that is traditional on certain aspects and that includes the people that I date. And there's also a lot of anti-LGBTQ that goes on in my family as well. So I've been told by my parents and like some family members are like oh my god imagine you dated someone black or worse a woman and it doesn't sit right with me because I would say I'm a liberated person and I will love whoever the heck I want to love and date whoever I want to date and I don't think somebody's gender identity or their race should define who I decide to have a, a relationship with and in general just stop me from wanting to introduce anybody to my family in general, even if it's their standards, just because I'm like, you guys are so judgmental and already so narrow-minded in certain ways that it doesn't make me feel comfortable. Yeah, because why should who you love affect your parents? It's just like, I love who I love is not going to affect you personally. Just let me be happy. Like You should, as a parent, want your kid to be happy no matter what. So why would it matter who I love and who's making me happy? I feel that honestly, any culture, not any culture, most cultures, at least the one I grew up with, which is the Latin culture, they tend to be very traditional with their values. I actually had a cousin who was minoring in theater and they were doing like a small little production based on the LGBTQ community. And my parents, my uncles and aunt, of course, were going to go. And there was a scene where this girl, you know, and another girl kissed. And they're just like, it, I don't know. I feel like you had to be there. But the way the audience was there, you can just tell that the audience was traditionally Latin culture. But when that scene happened, everyone was like, <gasps> like, they just looked away. And I don't know, like. It's just crazy to me to see that continuously. And why is it like that? You know, I don't think it should be like that. You know, you love who you love. You can do whatever you want to your body. 
like it's your body who's gonna stop you does it affect you no does it affect your friend your your cousin your your family no it doesn't affect you so why are you gonna be judging other people if it's not affecting you at all families like that are super damaging it's really hard to like you know be around something like that because it's such a toxic space Uh and especially if you never feel welcome like you know how people are always like you know you're not really like people always want to say like you know you're not really dating the family you're dating the person but in a sense yeah especially if that person is super family involved um there's a specific thing that I want you guys to see and it's she discusses the dichotomy between ho versus partner I think that the term wifey material can be something that causes a dichotomy in the way that men not all but some and many may view women I think that the term wifey material can be a term that is a dichotomy between the binary ideas of a woman being either a hoe or um, being, you know, somebody who goes around and is unloyal and versus being somebody who is loyal and, and be able to cook and always being there for their partner. You know, and it creates this dichotomy that women can only be two things um, where I think that women are, are much more dimensional. And I think that we are, we offer so much more than that. Some people can be both, you know, a ho and a wifey at the same time but i think that it's it can be a double-edged sword for a term like this to be able to kind of sectionalize certain women to be certain things when we can be everything we can be the whole package and there's nothing wrong with us expressing our sexuality through the amount of people that we decide to have sexual relations with um and we could also be the full package um, but I think that that's where the double-edged sword comes in. It's something to be proud of to be a wifey. It's something to tell your girlfriends, hey, you are a wifey girl. And I love that. Um, but you can also be a hoe and live your best life, you know? And so I think that this term is a double-edged sword when you really think about it contextually with society. But I think that it's also a great term to empower. And I love that. And I think that being a hoe is something to empower too, because you are living your sexual freedom. And that's something to also own up to what is wifey material to you guys? To me, I feel like wifey material is, like, still, like, in the 1950s. Like, white, like, women are supposed to just be housewives, like, take care of the kids, cook clean, like, make sure everything's, like, pristine, but then at the same time, well, you also have to work, and you also have to do this, like, but originally, you're supposed to, like, make sure the house is clean, kids are taken care of, like, there's food on the table, and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, if I'm working and busting my butt to bring in a paycheck and you're working and busting your butt to pay, bring in a paycheck, then we need to make sure that the kids are taken care of and we need to make sure that there's food in the house and we need to make sure that the house is clean because you live here too and, and you pay the bills too and you like make the mess too. So we can fi- like clean it together. Yeah, um, I think going off of that, um, there's an expectation uh, not only from, uh, I guess, a man, but also the man's family. Um, I uh, So my boyfriend's mom uh, was cooking one time and I was there um, and she actually told him, uh, she made a comment like, oh, you know, I love cooking for you because someday it's going to be another woman cooking for you. And I was thinking, you know, maybe he's going to be cooking for himself. <laughs> maybe it's not going to be, uh, you know, the woman's responsibility, certainly not mine. I mean, I like to cook, but it's not an expectation. And when it is an expectation, like it makes me not want to really do it. Amanda said, I'm not the one. (laughs) Hi, I'm Anel. I'm Gustavo. I'm Minuet. And I'm Jessica. And today we'll be discussing about double standards and birth control. Grow. A. Hair. Period. We as a society have associated the saying for a man to grow a pair of balls when actually it was meant for a woman to grow a pair of ovaries. Same with the saying, you're a p-. Um, All these powerful lingua were meant to bring power and strength to the woman and the vagina, but, I, but it has been misconstrued to fit the male agenda. My name is Dr. Shada Kapai. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Ethnic and Women's Studies at Cal Poly Pomona, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Some examples of double standards that I've, I've seen um, and that I've also 
come into my life in different ways are double standards that really impact the body and impact emotions um, and what kinds of emotions um, men and women are allowed to have or not allowed to have. And so I think of specifically emotional double standards where, um, where if a man expresses emotions, um, especially when a young boy expresses emotions, um, they're told to they're told very toxic language like man up, um, don't cry, don't be a sissy. I mean, very very toxic gendered language, um, where it's actually really expected and normalized um, for young girls to cry and express emotions. So that's one. Um, one standard that I can think of, um, a double, another double standard is how our bodies are viewed as beautiful or not beautiful. And so, you know, I think television plays a big role in this too, but a woman, especially an actress, um, is supposed to have a very specific body type. Um, and yet when I'm thinking of like sitcoms, we celebrate the dad bod you know, and so the standards that we have for expressive um, expression and the standards that we also have for embodiment, I think really get um, separated on, on, on a gendered um, spectrum and absolutely are, are subject to, to double standards. I agree with Dr. Kafai. Depending on a woman's body type, one type is seen more physically attractive than the other. Um, though both men and women experience fat prejudice, studies have found that overweight women feel more societal pressure to lose weight than overweight men. Mm -hmm. And then I would also like to address that Dr. Kafai made a good point when she was talking about like men or like boys in general not being able to express themselves. I believe that everybody has emotion, like everybody does have emotions, you know, no matter how much you try to mask it, we're all entitled to tell express how we feel. It's not necessarily easy, but we all should express it. You know, it's a form of being human, of uh, feeling accepted, being humanized, you know, and everybody wants to be accepted. So I think men should get out of that comfort zone of like having the shield, having to be masculine. And like she was saying, like a toxic um, gender emotion, like just, just be human, you know, you shouldn't be able to, to genderize emotions. Start out with um, your full name and title. Sure. It's Andrea Lesko, and I am a health educator at the Bronco Wellness Center. So we live in a sexist society, and this is sexist society. So um, we assume that everyone with a uterus is a woman, everyone with a penis is a man. Um, for me, I think it's unfortunate that, um, you know, it, usually the responsibility does fall on one person. Andrea Lusco makes a good point. Women known women are known to take on the responsibility when it comes to birth control. And we go through all these side effects. And as women, we go through the emotional, physical, and mental state. And it's not like we already deal with periods every month. So with that, we pay, we pay the price for birth control, which is pretty high, uh, female products, and a plan B as well. And from my experience, I have had a very, I've been very stressed when it comes to the pill and I have felt physically sick. I've also pick, um, had depression and it's been taking a huge toll on my body. Um, and then once my period, you know, once the pill is done for the month then here comes my period and it's just like a whole mess all over again. Yeah, I think um, I agree. You know, when I'm, I'm on the pill and I remember I get so frustrated or I get so emotional over little things and people tell me like, are you okay? And I'm like, and I, at first I didn't understand, like, I did not know, know why I was feeling so many things, but then, you know, I remember, you know, since I've been on the pill, my hormones have been everywhere. I can't control anything. Um, I think that's just the best way is just communication. Like we have to speak on, you know, what we're going through. Cause a lot of people don't know, especially a lot of men don't know that birth control literally makes us feel many, many things that we can't even explain. And for my experience on birth control, I haven't been on it for very long, but, and, and I haven't seen too much of a drastic change, um, but here are the side effects and warnings that every birth control comes with. Is it different languages or? 
It's 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 all in English, front and back. back. Oh my god! It looks like and a. I think. Sorry. It looks like a map. Yes, it's, it's a lot, and um, I think the fact that we have so much side effects and warnings, people expect women to just keep their emotions intact. I mean, you know, we're all humans. We're we're all gonna lash out on something small or big, or or we're gonna just, you know, one side effect is depression. We're not gonna be the happiest for um, certain days. So people just have to keep that in mind. So actually, according to the CDC in 2017 and 2019, 65.3% of women aged 15 through 49 in the US are currently using contraceptions. Uh, the most common being female sterilization, 18%, contraceptive pills, 14, long acting reversible contraceptives, um, 10%, and then the male condom, only 8%. So 8%. I think that's a, mm -hmm, 8%. <laughs> and I think that's a visual representation of power that men have over like societal norms because 8% of people, 8% of men using condoms is not right, you know? And that's the only form of male birth control that we do see. Like besides the condom, we do have abstinence and sterilization. So there's not very much options that men can uh, take. So I don't know why men are not taking them. So my question to the men is if you're a man and your, jo your job is to protect the women, why are we not doing more to stop them from the emotional, physical, and mental stress they have on top of everything else? And I would like to add to that, Gus, that when, it, when you do want to help out your partner, when it comes to like, you know, when them dealing with that, it's, it goes a long way for doing little things such as getting their favorite snacks or getting them a cup of coffee. And it really will brighten up their day and will change their whole mood and then it will make it a lot easier for them with the help of their other partner. Thank you so much for watching. Catch us next week on another episode of Brave Space. Where we'll talk about women in the workplace. What did you learn today? Resources are in the bio. Please share with all your friends and family. This could be your Brave Space too.